Good morning to those of you gathered here for worship in the building at Second Presbyterian Church in Portsmouth, Ohio, and good morning to those of you listening on the radio, and good afternoon to those who will be watching this on YouTube a little bit later today. Once again, I am grateful to Dr. Stan Workman, our Director of Music, for providing today's uh, music, and I'm also grateful to a friend of Second Pres, Lindsay Williams, who is providing our special music today. I have a few announcements for you before we begin our worship, and you can find them on the first page in your bulletin. First is just a reminder that our Sunday Vespers Hymn Sing service returns today at its new time, 6 o'clock, um, <clears throat> and you have the song sheet for that, so you get a little preview of some of the songs that you'll be hearing this evening. So that's tonight at 6 o'clock on WIOI. Um, we'll be gathering for Sunday School again today, at a location to be determined. We thought we'd do it outside, but it's a little chilly this morning. Um, so if you are interested in staying for Sunday school, please find Mike Rays and let him know, and we will pick a place to meet. In your mail at home this week, you should have gotten a little brochure, a little reading list for our 100 days of scripture. Um, many of us have probably been counting the days that this global pandemic has lasted, and I thought, well, maybe let's count something else instead. So we will be reading 100 days of scripture, um, and I have started a blog where I will post a reflection on each day's reading. Um, and so my hope is that, my prayer is that, this habit of reading 100 days of scripture will give us a deeper understanding of God, our world, and the length, height, and breadth and depth of God's love for us and for our world. And it would be nice to have something positive to focus on in a time when we seem to only see so many negative things that are happening. And speaking of positive things, there's one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, you should have a nice bright orange flyer with your bulletin. And I hope that you will consider attending the Emancipation Day celebra celebration planned for Tuesday, September 22nd, rain or shine, to commemorate the day that President Abraham Lincoln declared all enslaved people in the states currently engaged in rebellion against the Union shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. Al Oliver is the keynote speaker at 5.30, and then there will be a walking tour throughout Portsmouth, about three quarters of a mile, where you will meet some local historical figures who will tell you about their roles in the abolition movement and the fight for civil and equal rights. And as a special note, President Abraham Lincoln will be there too, and he may look suspiciously familiar to those of us from Second Presbyterian Church. So tickets for the walking tour are just $2 and are available from the website that is listed on the back side of this flyer. Um, and all proceeds will benefit the Portsmouth Unity Art Project, which is responsible for the new banners that are gonna be dedicated um, at this event. So if you have more questions about that, talk to Abraham Lincoln after the service and he'll get you some more details. I am grateful that you are worshiping with us today, and my prayer is that God will come close to you in this time of worship, and that God will give you whatever it is that you need this day, for this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it.
Please join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletins. Bless the Lord, O my soul, for the Lord is great, clothed with honor and majesty, wrapped in light as with a garment. The Lord stretches out the heavens like a tent and sets the beams of your chambers on the waters. The Lord set the earth on its foundations so that it shall never be shaken. From the Lord's lofty abode, the mountains are watered and the earth is satisfied with the fruit of the Lord's work. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom, you have made them all. We will sing to the Lord as long as we live. We will sing praise to our God while we have breath, for we rejoice in the Lord. And let us pray. Holy God, you are more than we could ever imagine. And just when we think we have you figured out, you reveal yourself to be so much higher and deeper and stronger than we thought before. Continue to expand our minds and hearts and imaginations that we may absorb and reflect your love in deeper and brighter ways in a world that is hungry for hope. Lord, we would follow you wherever you might lead, but we all, like sheep, have gone our own way. Forgive us when we stumble and when we stray. Forgive us when, distracted, we lose our way. Hear us now as we confess silently to you in the ways we have personally gone astray this week. Lead us back into your fold and guard our very souls. Remind us that when we trust in our good shepherd, there is no need to fear. Therefore, help us to live in peace with ourselves and with each other. Be the one to whom we turn, whose hand we hold, the shepherd who leads us safely to the fold. Call us by name and open the gate for us that we may come and go freely, have life, and have it abundantly. Lord, we would follow you wherever you might lead. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our first scripture reading today is from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The words of the teacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What do people gain from all the toil at which they toil under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hurries to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes to the north, round and round goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they continue to flow. All things are wearisome, more than one can express. The eye is not satisfied with seeing or the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has already been in the ages before us. The people of long ago are not remembered nor will there be any remembrance of people yet to come by those who come after them. I, the teacher, when king over Israel in Jerusalem, applied my mind to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to human beings to be busy with. I saw all the deeds that are done under the sun and see all is vanity and a chasing after wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, I have acquired great wisdom surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me and my mind has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my mind to no wisdom and to no madness and folly. I perceived that this also is but a chasing after wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation. And those who increase knowledge increase sorrow. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice. Take my love, my Lord, I pray. 
Our second scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, and I will be reading verses 19 through 21. Hear again what the Spirit is saying to you, the church. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Once upon a time, in a land far, far away, there lived a king who devoted himself to discerning the meaning of life in all matters. He surpassed all who were before him in achievement, dedicating himself to the singular pursuit of wisdom. And for the benefit of future generations, he recorded his journey and his discoveries. A man of both joy and woe, he became painfully aware along this journey that for all his toil, there was nothing to be gained under the sun. His name was Koheleth, which means the teacher. And he was king over Israel, verse 1 in Ecclesiastes tells us. And this book of Ecclesiastes is his autobiography of sorts. And it is known as the strangest book in the Bible. Like Sam and Frodo in The Lord of the Rings, Dorothy and company in The Wizard of Oz, and Dory and Nemo's dad in Finding Nemo, the book of Ecclesiastes is the story of a quest. But rather than just a quest for a thing or a person, this is a spiritual quest. The story of one man's journey for the meaning of life and his search for wisdom. And that's what this sermon series is all about, Secrets of a Good Life, the pursuit of wisdom, where to find it and what to do with it once you find it. And if you can recall the last four weeks, our passages from the books of book of Proverbs, when it talks about wisdom, it's been encouraging and inspiring and uplifting. And Ecclesiastes is not. In fact, it's kind of the opposite of Proverbs. I mean, you know, when the book starts out saying vanity of vanities, says the teacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What do people gain from all the toil at which they toil under the sun? A generation goes, a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. Where Ecclesiastes is optimistic and sees where Proverbs is optimistic and sees possibilities everywhere, Ecclesiastes is pessimistic, seeing only emptiness and nothingness, what it calls vanity of vanities. Where Proverbs believes that there is great value in work and a job well done, Ecclesiastes questions what is to be gained from all of the toil at which they toil under the sun? Where Proverbs believes that people have the ability to change and grow, Ecclesiastes says a generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. In other words, if Proverbs is Winnie the Pooh, the class Ecclesiastes is definitely Eeyore. And yet, both fall under the same category of wisdom literature. It's both the same genre of literature in the Bible. And both do provide valuable insights into wisdom. They just speak from different perspectives. And I think there is merit to both sides of this wisdom coin. Maybe in our younger, more idealistic, naive days, we need the wisdoms of Proverbs for guidance and inspiration. But maybe as we get a little older and begin to see the reality of our life and our world, 
Maybe the kind of wisdom we need is less rooted in the idea of aspiration and more in the very basic way of navigating the complexities of life. So Ecclesiastes is this autobiography of one man's spiritual journey, his quest for wisdom and the meaning of life. And like most stories about a quest, this is one that we can revisit again and again along each stage of our own journeys. Well, we can revisit it again and again if we can just get over the depressiveness of this book. Biblical scholar William Brown writes, Ecclesiastes is in a fundamental sense an obituary. Indeed, the obituary of life itself. Not the kind of quote you want on the back of your book jacket, I'm afraid. But Ecclesiastes is a product of its time. Koheleth, the teacher, its author, lived in a time of melancholy and questioning. It was a culture of death and disillusionment. Israel has been restored after the Babylonian exile, so they're home, but they still find itself ruled by Persia, a foreign kingdom. And the daily challenge for them is just to survive until the next day. And all around them, things are changing. Socioeconomic developments were happening every day that dramatically shifted their social landscape. The economy became increasingly commercialized. A new kind of currency was introduced, and an aggressive form of taxation was implemented under this new Persian rule. A new market-driven economy of global proportions was born, and many entrepreneurial opportunities emerged. But the rapid growth did not benefit all the people. To those who already had capital, the door to immediate opportunities to gain more capital opened. But those of a lesser means were at a distinct disadvantage. And as a result, I have read that the shrinking middle class felt overwhelmed with the opportunities and the risks, unsure of what was a sound financial investment for their very modest resources. So volatile was this economy that wealth even vast wealth could be here today and gone tomorrow. Does any of that sound familiar? Kohelis' book, Ecclesiastes, naturally reflects the anxieties and the hopes of his day. The lack of security and well-being felt amongst just the ordinary, everyday people reflected the anxieties of the hopes of issues of lasting gain in a world that was ever-changing, and the ever-present problem of death and tragedy, which just never seem to go away. And his book is full of contradictions, many of which he leaves unresolved, mainly to provoke conversation and reflection. But so, too, life is full of contradictions and complexity, as we talked about in last week's sermon. We would love for things to fall neatly into one of two categories, but it rarely ever does. Life is messier than that. People are messier than that. So the book of Ecclesiastes is unlike any other book in the Bible. Some even call it a misfit. And given that we're living in a global pandemic full of anxieties and contradictions, perhaps it's the perfect book for us to study right now as we try to find the meaning and wisdom in our lives among less than ideal circumstances. So all of this, the search for meaning and wisdom in complex and anxious times, makes me think of someone named Viktor Frankl. 
He was a psychiatrist and a neurologist who wrote about his time as an inmate of a concentration camp during the Second World War. And he writes that those who survived the longest in the camps were not the physically strongest, but instead it was those who retained a sense of control over their environment. And by that, he means the ones who walked around comforting others, the ones who walked around giving away their last piece of bread. To him, they were proof that everything can be taken away from a person except the freedom to choose one's own attitude in any given set of circumstances. So ultimately, Frankel was left with a message of hope from the concentration camps, that even in the midst of the most absurd, painful, and dispiriting of circumstances, life can have meaning, and suffering can too. And as a little spoiler alert, that's what Koheleth and Ecclesiastes believe too, although it doesn't sound like it from what we read in today's passage. But remember, this book is written as a journey, as a quest, and you have to read the whole book to get to that conclusion. Today we start the journey, which is a little pessimistic, but it's only the beginning of the story. Ecclesiastes takes a very real, very nitty-gritty look at the realities of our world. The fragility of human existence, the inability of humans to secure themselves, and the absolute unknowableness of God's divine will. Ecclesiastes is a book that pulls no punches, beats around no bushes, and calls it just like it sees it. And maybe that's what we need right now. And yet, yet there is this amidst the negativity and pessimism. There is this unmistakable element of carpe diem, an urgency to seize the day before the sun sets, to choose how you will pursue wisdom and respond to the complexities and frustrations in your own life. But rather than climbing into an ivory tower to try to penetrate the unknowableness of God's mind, Ecclesiastes urges us to seize the day by seeking the wisdom found in the daily grind of living. Even for readers like us, so many years after the book was originally written, Ecclesiastes offers up what one scholar calls the dread and delight of every day, the glory of the ordinary. If we live unexamined lives, devoid of the quest for wisdom, if we don't pursue anything, if we don't try to be wise in God's eyes, we will waste a large part of our time and our energy searching for things which are, in the end, vanity of vanities, empty and meaningless, things that will disappear like vapor. We will spend our lives storing up treasures on earth, as Matthew 6 says. Treasures that will ultimately rot and rust. You may remember that it was Socrates who said, the unexamined life is not worth living. And there is much truth to that. And the result of an, unex of an examined life for a believer is inevitability, this heightened awareness of life's vanity. It's futility and fragility, it's absurdity and obscurity. And the knowledge, too, that somehow, mysteriously, it is all rooted 
in the inscrutable and unknowable will of God, revealed to us in the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. Maybe we'll never be able to explain it or to completely understand it. But in the midst of emptiness and nothingness, we can believe that it is rooted and founded in the meaning of the life and death of Jesus Christ. And that is something, may not be able to explain it, may not be able to understand it, but we can know it in our hearts and believe it in our bones. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Please join me in the affirmation of faith as it is printed in your bulletins. Jesus taught us to speak of hope as the coming of God's kingdom. We believe that God is at work in our world, turning hopeless and evil situations into good. We believe that goodness and justice will triumph in the end and that all shall be well. One day all tears will be wiped away. The lamb will lie down with the lion and justice will roll down like a mighty stream. True peace and true reconciliation are not only desired, they are assured and guaranteed in Christ. This is our faith, and this is our hope. And let us pray. Shepherding God, we are grateful for your protective care over us and our world. You are our refuge in dangerous times and the port in the storms of our life. Thank you for giving us just enough grace for today's troubles. Give us just enough tomorrow as well. Compassionate God, we pray for vulnerable people all over this world. People without power who live in places of terror and violence, fear and oppression. Protect them, God. We feel so powerless ourselves to help them, but encourage and empower us to work for peace and freedom from fear in our own contexts. God of grace, we pray for those whose lives have been turned upside down by various disasters, pandemics, floods, fires, drought-driven famine. Bring courage and hope to them, and through their pain may they remain connected to you in prayer. We pray for those who say there is no God. May we, through our own words and deeds, demonstrate the joy and peace of a spirit-centered existence. God of community, we pray for our own congregation as we remain separated from each other. Strengthen and unify your church here in Portsmouth and around the world, showing us how we can be the disciples you have created us to be. May we be a source of hope for our families and our neighborhoods. Return the sick to health and well-being. Relieve the suffering of those who have lost loved ones, are unable to find meaningful employment, those who fear the challenges of old age, and those who struggle with addiction, loneliness, and mental health concerns. Guide us, Great Shepherd, into your paths of right relationships with the people you have put in our lives and who cross our paths every day. And hear us now as we speak to you from the quietest corners of our hearts, the joys and concerns we bring to worship today.
remind us that even before we ask of it, you are already at work in each of these situations. May we be changed by the prayers we offer as you work through us and perhaps even despite us to bring healing and wholeness into our world. And hear us now as we pray together the way the saints of the church have prayed for generation after generation. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our benediction this morning comes once again from Maya Angelou. So take these words with you as you go. May you continue to be who and how you are to astonish a mean world with your acts of kindness. May you continue to allow humor to lighten the burden of your tender heart. May you continue to laugh in the midst of the dark world that others may hear the grandeur of God in your laughter. May you put the mantle of your protection around the bodies of the young and defenseless and those in need of justice. And may faith be the bridge you build to overcome evil and to welcome good. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.